And uh, that has um, confirmed what I have always believed. Amen. Uh, this church, it's not the population, but the vision. Yes. And uh, praise the Lord, now, now I know better. Amen. God bless you all. Um, like you said, I'll be leaving tomorrow, and I request your prayers. Yes. And like he said, I've been trying to get him to visit us. <laughs> Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Well, brother Joe, you can see the church has approved. Yes. So I, I have told him if he comes one time, I can only try to get him to come one time. If he comes one time, he'll come the second time without my invitation. Amen. See what God is doing over there. Yes. God bless you all. Um, it's been a wonderful time. I've enjoyed myself being here. Brother Joe has been a wonderful friend. Um, his father was my good friend. Yes. And Brother Dan was my good friend. Yes. And that friendship has continued. Yes. And I always feel at home when I come to this place. Yes. So I'm so thankful to the Lord for the spirit of God in this assembly. Yes. God bless you all. Um, if you will please reverence the word with me, I'd like to turn to the scriptures right away. <clears throat> And read from the book of First Thessalonians. Uh, song leader, I believe that God inspired you somehow tonight because you are already saying what I was coming to say. I heard you many times talk about prayer, prayer, hour of prayer. I said, praise the Lord. That's a confirmation because that's what I'm going to preach about tonight. Just prayers. Praise God. First Thessalonians um, uh, chapters 5 and verse 17. <clears throat> chapters 5 and verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. That's all he said. Please be seated. <laughs> That's big enough to be a verse. Amen. I think the smallest verse in the Bible is, uh, and Jesus wept. This is another one. Pray without ceasing. Amen. It's so important that yes. it had to be one verse of the scripture. Amen. And tonight, uh, I want to speak on the topic of prayers. Um, there are three things that bring us to the house of God. <coughs> three things bring us to the house of God. One of them is prayers. The second one is praises and worship. The third one is the word of God. Right. And every child of God must fully participate Amen. in these three aspects of worship. Yes. You must fully participate to show that you have been to the house of God. Amen. Uh, you may come to the house of God and pray, but you don't care about the word of God. Then you've not completed the circle. Or you may come to the house of God and don't pray. You're only interested in the word. That's fine. But you have not completed the circle. Because prayer has its effect yes, before yes. God. Praises, singing praises yes. has effect before God. Yes. And then the word of God caps it all. Yes. Yes. And just like the Bible says to your faith, add knowledge, add virtue, add this, add this. Each time we come to the house of God, we come to add something yes. to our spiritual life. Now, I want you to please pay an undivided attention. Like I did say um, the last time, my ministry is not the type that tickles the ear or entertain the God's children. God has given me a very simple ministry that makes you think if you're ready to meet the Lord. Amen. Amen. And that's what I think is more important. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Prayer is so important that the Lord Jesus prayed. Do you pray? You may think you pray, but there's another scripture that says we sometimes pray amiss. Amen. Yes. Yes. I'm going to show by God's grace what it takes for prayers to be acceptable to God. For prayers to be answered. Because Brother Branham said, what God has done for anybody 
If anybody else meets the same standard, God does the same thing for him. And the Bible says Elijah was a man of like passion as we are. But he prayed and God answered him. Brother Branham was a man of like passion like we are. Brother Branham gets hungry, he he, he sleeps, he gets tired. He's a man. But he prayed and God answered. There must be a secret to prayers. And if we don't understand these things, we pray amiss. Prayer to us in Africa is not it's not a joke. It's our life. Because in Africa, you must have a supernatural backup. It's either the devil is backing you up or God is backing you up. It's like the experience Moses had in Egypt. God backing up Moses and the devil backing up uh, uh, Janus uh, and Jambres. And Moses will perform a miracle and they will perform a magic. So to us, prayer is our life. And I am here to testify that God is faithful. And when we pray sincerely, like the angel told Brother Branham, if you can be honest, because the thoughts of the heart, they ring so loud like a bell in heaven, and there's nothing hidden in the sight of him with whom we deal. So, if the Lord will pray, if the apostles will pray, if Brother Branham will pray, then we must cultivate the characteristics of prayer. Sincere prayer. All right. Where are we supposed to pray? When we go to church? That's part of it. But we are told in the scripture that we just read to pray without stopping. Pray without ceasing. Yes. So we can pray on the job. Yes. Sure. You don't have to open your eyes and kneel down somewhere. You can pray while you are walking. Yeah, right. You can pray on the road while you are driving. Yes. Yeah. We pray on the, on the table. Some people are too hungry to pray. Too hungry. They eat half of the food. <laughs> then they remember they have not prayed. Amen. No, that, that's not right. You must pray, even if it's water that you have to drink. Give God thanks for water. There are people in the hospital right now that cannot drink. They cannot eat. See? So, those little things we think are not important, that is when God watches our heart, how thankful we are. You know, when you go to the restroom, when you go to the restroom, you don't thank God for it, do you? But do you realize there are people who cannot go to the restroom? Amen. They have to have surgery to be able to do what we easily go to the restroom and do as if it's no problem. And yet, there are people dying in the hospital. They can't go to the restroom without assistance. So, these little things make God judge the measure of our gratitude. When we leave our homes and come back, we're supposed to give thanks. Amen. Yes, sir. All right, let me go to something else here. In the book of Matthew, chapters, uh, if you'd like to please turn with me, the book of Matthew, chapters 21, I want to read something here that will help us in our pr- prayer life. Matthew chapter 21, I'm reading verse 12 and 13. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. All right. The house of God is like no other house. No other house can be compared with the house of God. No other house. 
Why? The house of God is a gate of heaven. Did you remember Jacob in his journey? Jacob got to a place and he slept and he saw a vision. Angels going up and coming down and going up and coming down and he saw God up there and he said, wait a minute. This must be the gate of heaven and I didn't know it. And he built something there to remind him. Where we come to dedicate our children, we come to marry our young. We come to celebrate the life of the dead. The house of God is like no other house. It is a house of life and death. It is a house of reconciliation between mortal and immortal. It is a house where we meet face to face with our maker. We may not see him physically, but spiritually he's present. Yes, sir. If the president of the country came here today, this house will be in the uh, front page of a- every newspaper in America. Yes. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Good. But do you know that the, the God of heaven and earth, because he said so, comes to this place when you and I come here. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. When Solomon built him a house, God came down and said, today I place my name in this place. If my people who are called by my name will turn away from their sins and seek my face, I will hear their cry from heaven and I will heal their land. Only in the house of God will you get such covenants and promises. No other place. So when we come to the house of God, we must first realize where we are. The house of God is different from our houses. This is the house of God. It's the gate of heaven. You go from here to heaven or from here to hell. You believe God's word and receive God's word, you're on your way to heaven. You reject God's word, you're condemned by the word. So the house of God is primarily the house of communication with God, not any other thing. We come here, leave every other thing. Come here to communicate, have communion with God. The house of God. The reverence we give to God should manifest in our approach to his temple or to his altar. We in Africa have better understanding of the the, the reverence that should be given to the house of God because you have outside the cities, way back in the interiors, you have all kinds of temples, all kinds of altars, Dedicated to different gods. And when you see the worshippers come, they come reverently. Fearfully. Because the the, the devils that worship don't have mercy. The only God that has mercy is the God we worship. No other God has mercy. Devils don't forgive. Demons don't forgive. Witchcraft don't forgive. The only God that forgives is Jesus Christ. So, When we come to the house of the Lord, our motive, if we want our prayers answered, watch your motive. Watch the purpose for which you come to the house of God. Here we see our Lord Jesus, the God to whom the temple was dedicated to. He comes to the temple and he sees people buying and selling doves and other things that And they forgot the primary purpose for which the house was built. What did he do? He passed judgment immediately. And turned down the tables, chased them away, and called them thieves. Where were these thieves found? In the house of God. Should thieves be found in the house of God? Now, These are some of the things that make prayers ineffective. When the motive is not right. 
If our motives are not right, we may kneel down and lift up our voices and lift up our... If our motives are not right, the prayers will not be answered. Now, this scripture was quoted from the book of Isaiah. If you'd like to please mark that down. Um, Isaiah chapter 56. That's what our Lord Jesus was referring to. I want to pick out something else from that Isaiah chapter 56. Chapter 56 and verse 7. Verse 7. Even then will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted unto me upon my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Amen. For the Jews, for the Gentiles, for the Samaritans, anybody. Amen. Amen. Coming to the house of God must realize that that's the house of prayer. That's the first and most important thing. Prayer. Now, the Lord says he will bring his people to his house and make them joyful. That's the result of our prayer. We pray, God answers, and we rejoice. Yes. But you see, the Lord Jesus came and saw them selling and buying and rebuked them, and there was no joy in the house of the Lord because they were doing the wrong thing. So, we believe the message of the hour. That's one thing. But don't forget, the efficacy of prayer Depends on your relationship with God. Amen. Relationship. Relationship. God says, they that draw close to me, I will draw close to them. Amen. If your relationship with God is right, <coughs> before you pray, he will answer. The answer may not come immediately like the case of Daniel. The Bible says, when Daniel began to pray, God answered. But the answer was delayed. Amen. But it was not stopped. It only was delayed. When we pray correctly, it may delay for some time, but it will eventually come. The important thing is to pray properly. To have a good motive, a good relationship with God. Now, look at the book of Jeremiah. If you'd like to please turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. Chapter 7. It's more of a teaching than a preaching tonight. Yes, right. <laughs> Chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 8. Reading from verse 8 to 12. Look at this rebuke here. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom ye know not and come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered to do all these abominations is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes Behold, even I have seen it, said the Lord. But go now unto my place, which was in Shalom, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. All right, we have the natural Israel, we have the spiritual Israel. Amen. Amen. We are part of the spiritual Israel. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. Here he rebukes Israel for conducting themselves wrongly in the house of God. He yes. says, you, you, you commit this, you commit that, you commit this, you do all that. Then you come to my house and you stand before me. Is it because my house has lost meaning to you? Amen. When we come to the house of the Lord, we should know where we are coming. That reverence, we must not lose that reverence. 
He says, well, go to Shiloh and find out what I did to my house where I first placed my name. See what I did to it. Actually, the real house where God dwells is in you and me. But yet, we build him a house. God loves for us to build him a house. But you and I, who are the real temples where God dwells, must not lose that reverence. So that we don't come to the house of the, the house of the Lord carelessly. After we've done so much worldliness, spoken wrongly, swore wrongly, those worldly things, then we come to the house of the Lord and we sit down as if nothing is wrong. God sees it. He says, my eyes have seen it. My eyes have seen it. And when we come like that, having sinned and without confessing our sins, and we're praying to God for his blessings. We're praying to God for healing. We're praying for, to God for uh, uh, one thing or the other. But God sees different from our heart. He says, my eyes have seen it. What the pastor has not seen, God sees it. What the pastor has not heard, God hears it. And when we come like that to the house of the Lord, he says, did I deliver you because of these abominations? If we claim to be saved, Saved by God's grace. We must have been saved from something. Amen. If we were liars in the past, you know, sinners, Amen. sin has different grades. Whatever God saved you from, you should know what God saved you from. Right. God is saying here, did I deliver you because of this, to commit these abominations? God did not deliver us to go back like uh, 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 swines to our vomit. Or like dogs. God saved us for his glory. So that when we lift up our holy hands in prayer. God will recognize. These are my children calling upon me. And when he looks at us. He will not see an abomination. Because if he sees an abomination. Then that prayer will not be answered. The Bible says the prayer of a sinner. Is an abomination to God. Now. He speaks about bringing his people to his house and their sacrifices will be accepted in his altar. Do you know that our offerings that we bring to God has something to do with our prayers? Amen. The offerings we bring to God. It has something to do with our prayers. See? Sometimes God said to one of the prophets at Amos or Haggai, he says... Um, Tell the people, go to the, the, to the woods and get wood and fix my house. They live in beautiful houses, but my house is not taken care of. He says, because of that, you sow, you reap not. You eat, you are not satisfied. You cover yourself and yet you are cold. Because you did not take care of my house. So, our offerings that we bring to God. Now, for example, God says, the offering of a harlot... A whore should not be brought into the house of God. God says the price of a dog should not be brought into the house of God. We know none of us do those things anymore. But the businesses we do, if there's any crooked business, that offering will not be accepted. The Bible says the prayer of a sinner is an abomination to God. It is even worse when he brings the offering with a sinful hand. So you, you see, prayer for miracles to happen, prayers for God to answer, has conditionalities. There has to be conditions Amen. that we need to abide with. There is nothing in the scriptures or there is no aspect of God's worship that you can do anyhow. It has to be God's way. Amen. If it is not God's way, it is not acceptable. All right. Let me read something else here. The book of Matthew, please. Chapters 21 again. Matthew chapters 21. Prayer. A prayerful Christian is a very strong Christian. Chapters 21 of Matthew. I'm reading verse 21 and 22. 21 and 22. <coughs> and when he was come into the temple, the chief priest... No, no, I'm reading the wrong place. Okay, Matthew 21... Okay, 
I'm reading the wrong place. I'm sorry. Okay. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto the mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things, whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. receive. Alright. Two things we need to highlight here. Conditions of prayers to be answered. Doubt. Believe. Jesus said, when the apostles asked him about the fig tree, he said, you can do it too. You can do it. You can do it if you can pray without a doubt. Without a doubt. Amen. Now, for example, if somebody was very sick and you were asked to come and pray, what crosses your mind first? First, you believe you do not have a gift. But there's nowhere the Bible says um, if anyone is sick, look for anybody who has a gift. Amen. You never say that. See, it says a fervent prayer, effectual prayer of a righteous man, availeth much. Who is a righteous man? A righteous man is any man or any woman who obeys God. That's all it takes. Obey. Whatever God says, obey. That makes you righteous. Not I don't steal, I don't lie. That's good. There are many unbelievers that do the same. But when God gives a command, they don't obey. Now, secondly, it says if you ask anything, you can get it if you believe. There are many things we pray about, but we don't believe that we're going to get them. We pray about them and we forget about them. We don't believe. We don't pray because we believe. To believe is acting as if you've already received it. Some of us believe men more than we believe God. If a man says, well, I'll give you a hundred dollars. You believe that more than God saying, if you pray without a doubt. See? How, how many believe that? And we pray all the time and our hearts filled with doubt. And that's why prayers are not answered. Sometimes we are in a hurry Sometimes we pray without love in our heart. Brother Branham says, if you, before you pray for anybody, be, be sure you love the person. Amen. See? Because if love projects, then divine grace will follow. Yes. See? Love has to project. If you want God to answer your prayer, don't pray to God without faith or with doubts in your heart. The Bible says, he that doubts can never receive anything from God. After all, it is not your ability that will answer the prayer. It's not your power that will answer the prayer. If I'm called to pray for a dead man, I pray for a dead man. It's God that will raise him up, not me. So there's no way you can say, I failed. I didn't do it because I'm able. I did it in obedience. The Bible says, is any among you sick? Let him call the elders. The elders may not have gifts. They may not be Brother Branham's. They may not have healing powers. But the Bible says, call the elders. All they need to do is obey. Take the oil, anoint the sick, and pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let God do the rest. But you see, if you're invited to pray for the sick, well, uh, I'm not Brother Branham. Uh, I'm not a prophet. God never said so. That's right. That's what Christ was telling the apostles. If you are going to pray, put doubts away. I can give testimonies of the wonderful things that God has done in my ministry back home. Some of you will be so surprised it will sound unbelievable, but true. But true. 
The only miracle I have not seen God perform for us over there is walking on water. That's all. Can I give one testimony? Yes. Let me just give this one. Or maybe another. <laughs> what prayers can do. You see, it's not enough to know the letters. You must also know the writer of the letter. If you receive the letter, you don't know who wrote it. How would you take it? It would mean little or nothing to you because you don't know who wrote it. But if you receive a letter from somebody you know, it will mean more to you. This book is a letter from God to his wife, to his bride. See? And we need to know him. The Bible says to know him is life. We were in our camp meeting one time. Now, this is on, on record. When Brother Joe comes, he will confirm it and come back and tell you that this is true. I still believe he's coming. No doubt in my mind. I don't know what time, but I keep believing because I'm a believer. Amen. Amen. We were in a camp meeting and uh, it's our custom to serve bread and tea in the morning to the brethren. And um, this particular morning, the bread was short. We only have 50 loaves of bread in a bag. And those that were supposed to supply us the bread were late in arriving. They had some problem baking the bread overnight. So the deacons came to me to say that we have problem about our breakfast. I said, what, are we, what else do we have? They said, we have rice. And I said, okay, tell the sisters to get the rice ready. Prepare the rice uh, just in case they fail to come. Meanwhile, let's go and pray. And uh, we put our heads together and we prayed for the bread to come. And the, the, the brethren don't know what was going on, just the deacons and myself. And uh, they were getting ready for their breakfast. And I told the deacons, go serve them what we have. That's after we had prayed. Go serve them what we have. And they brought the 50 bags, um, 50 loaves of bread in a bag. Not too big, but just uh, each person is supposed to um, get one loaf of bread. So they lined up and everybody was getting a loaf. Everybody was getting a loaf. Everybody, and the brethren in the camp meeting were over a thousand people. So um, everybody got one loaf of bread and yet we had 50 left. We didn't realize what was going on when everybody was taking a loaf. Nobody realized what was going on until at the end the last person got a loaf of bread and there was still 50 left. That was a miracle of multiplication. Yes, sir. God has done that. Yes, sir. He did it before he can do it again. Amen. One other testimony. If I want to talk about healings, there are too many. Too many. Come on. This is about my own child. She died. She died. In fact, she died twice. Ah. You know I'm standing on the holy ground. And everything I say here has to be absolutely correct. Yes. Yes. Amen. She died. She passed away. Pneumonia. She died of pneumonia. And we prayed all night. All night. And God raised her up. Amen. Another time I traveled on a missionary trip. And the same thing happened again. After, after some months. I wasn't there. But the ministers, the elders, the deacons, they came together. They prayed until God raised her up again. Today. She's a lawyer. Amen. See? What prayer can do? You know why I'm saying this? I want you to know that it's not Brother Branham. It's the God of Brother Branham. See? Those that believe John the Baptist, they followed Christ. And those that believe Brother Branham today follow Jesus Christ. Brother Branham came to introduce us to this God that Live it forever and ever. Amen. And when Brother Branham 
left. He didn't leave with the promises of God. God is still here with us. But you see, to pray to this mighty spirit, God is a spirit. He's here right now looking at me. He's looking at you. I don't know. He might be sitting here or walking the aisle. He's here right now. Right now. But you see, prayer can only be effective if your relationship with God is right. If the relationship is not right, you may know all the messages you want to know. None of us can know the Bible more than the devil. Yet he's the devil. Doesn't change him. But you see, Christ in you is the hope of glory. I was returning from a missionary trip one time. And my car stopped on the way. I ran out of gas. I had misjudged. I thought the gas I had would get to the next station. Coming through a jungle road. And uh, before I got to the city, my car stopped. And I came down to see what was wrong with my car. I discovered that I ran out of gas. So I just stood there, in the middle of nowhere, and I prayed. And I knew if I stayed there till night, I might be attacked by thieves or, you know, I don't know what would happen. And there was no way I could get to the city. So I was praying to God to help me. Brothers, sisters, listen to this. While I was there meditating deep, very deep in prayer, I heard somebody coming through the jungle with a, a 50 liter um, container, yeah. gas, 50 liter container of gas, yeah. carrying in between his, his two legs and coming from the bush. About 50 year old man coming from the bush. And I was standing there watching him and he just came straight to me and he said, you want to buy gas? I said, yes. Yes, sir. Please, I'd like to buy. He said, okay. I said, please, how much is that? He said, put it in first. I brought out my um, pipe, plastic pipe, and then put it in and he helped me raise the uh, jerry can up and we poured it into my car and uh, I thanked him very much. While I was trying to uh, lock up the tank of my car, he walked to the back of the car. And then I followed him. Before I could get to the back of the car, I saw him, I saw nobody. Gone. The man gone, the jerry can gone, everything gone. I stood there and I thought I was dreaming. You know, I stood there, lost. Then other vehicles passing, uh, blew their horn, peep, 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 peep. Then I came back to myself and I said, wait a minute, can it be true? I cranked my car, and I saw the gauge go up. I said, hey, this is real. I'm not dreaming. I got some gas. And then I drove my car home. God did that for me. He can do it for anybody. I know all of us here have one testimony or the other. But you see, what we're talking about today is the fundamental foundation of a child of God. If your children don't talk to you, you parents, if your children don't talk to you, how do you feel? Come on. So it is when we don't pray. When we don't spend enough time in prayer. Brother Brenham says we don't get results because we don't stay long enough to hear from God. Amen. See, we are hor- in a hurry in everything today. Everything is in a hurry. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Even prayer is in a hurry. But we need to pray. Because that is the power of a child of God. When I first came to America, I thought it was the kingdom of God. So beautiful. Then, suddenly I heard a siren blowing. I asked my friend, what's that for? He said, oh, that's um, an accident car. An accident took place and they're rushing them to the hospital. I said, oh, this is not the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, there will be no accidents. You know? <laughs> that was my first experience coming here. See? Everywhere looked so nice. I said, wait a minute. This is why people want to come to America and don't want to go back home. I said, but now, I know better. God let me hear a siren. Amen. And when I asked, what is that? They said, an accident. I said, no. In the kingdom of God, there will be no accident. Right. Even if I was given a free house, 
I will not live in America. You know why? God has not ordained for me to live here. I have a work to do in my country. And that is more important to me. See? So, prayers is what makes you a powerful Christian. It's not the message you know. Not knowledge. But your relationship with God. Prayer humbles you. Prayer makes you spiritually powerful. The devil will see you and go the other way. Because you are always in communication with God. Prayer makes you a genuine worshiper. A real worshiper. And when you can't pray, then you sing, you praise God. There are times you don't feel like praying. But you sing, you lift up your voice and sing and praise God. There is power in praises. What pulled down the walls of Jericho? Praises. What gave Jehoshaphat victory? Praises. Communication with God. Relationship with God. You may be very uh, 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 acceptable to people. Acceptable to preachers. Acceptable to everybody. But if you are not acceptable to God, you lost everything. Let me, let me go f- a little forward in what I want to read tonight. Look at uh, uh, the book of Matthew. Uh, I want to read chapters 18 again. Matthew chapters 18. Prayers. And verse 21, I believe. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times. But until 70 times 7. Have you ever tried to work out what that amounts to? And that is daily, not annually. This is one aspect of the word of God that tells us the secret of prayer answered. Or for you to get your prayer answered, what you ought to do. The conditions of getting your prayer answered. It has to do also with forgiveness. Forgiveness. In many scriptures, God refers to forgiveness as the condition of getting your prayer answered. The Bible says if you are bringing an offering to God and you realize you have something against your brother, drop your offering one side, go back to your brother, make it right. Then come back with your offering. He didn't say you should take your offering and go home. No. Bring it back. But go and make it right first so that your prayer will not be hindered. Some people get angry with one another one month, six months, and they're fine. I mean, they come to the house of God, they sing, they pray, they even partake on the Lord's table, the Lord's supper. And yet, they don't talk to one another. And they're praying. How can it be answered? Somebody don't like what the pastor said. And you don't go to the pastor and tell him. And the pastor don't know that you don't like what he said. And here he is, honestly, with all his heart, feeding you with the word of God. But you are not feeding. Because you are angry. How would God answer your prayer? Here, Peter wanted to know. How many times would my brother offend me? Because we offend one another. We do. Yes, we are human. We make mistakes. Sometimes you don't like what I said. You may not like my dressing. Let me give you one testimony. This, this might help somebody. There's this uh, assistant pastor in my church. No, not in my church, in Nigeria. He came to a meeting in, in my church. And he saw a brother. He had a very funny haircut. Very funny. He didn't like the way he, the, the hair was made. So he, he looked at him, and he looked at him, and he said, this brother is not a Christian. He can never be in the rapture. He was saying that in his heart. And the poor brother don't know what this man was saying in his heart. That night, that brother had a dream. The assistant pastor had a dream. In that dream, the rapture was taking place. And the brethren around him were, would change into white garments and take off, and change and take off. Everybody around him were changing and going in the rapture. 
And then that brother that he saw and said in his heart that this brother is not a Christian because of his funny haircut. He says he can never make the rapture. That brother was brought before him to his face and was watching the brother and the brother changed and went in the rapture. But he was sitting down there and he tried to go. He couldn't. He tried this way. He tried again. He sat down there and he burst into tears and he woke up. What does that teach us? Don't judge. Don't judge any man. And don't bear grudges in your heart. He should have gone to the brother and said, Brother, what kind of funny haircut is this? And maybe the brother would have said to him, It's because of this and because of that. And clean up his heart. But he didn't go to this brother. And people will miss the rapture because of little things that they have in their heart. David said, Search me, O Lord. And know my heart today. Today. That's every day. See if there be a wicked way in me. Not in my brother. Not in my sister. In me. Cleanse me from every sin. And set me free. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Because there are things we do and God will take away the Holy Spirit. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Amen. And renew a right spirit, a right spirit within me. Amen. When we come to the house of the Lord, we must be conscious of these things before we pray. How many times will my brother offend me? Peter wanted it to be seven times full stop. Not more. That's once every day. Seven days, no more. No more forgiveness. But the Lord said, no, I didn't say that. I said 70 times seven. In other words, keep forgiving. Amen. Find joy in forgiving. Amen. Forgive your wife. Forgive your husband. Forgive your children. Just find joy in forgiving. It purifies the soul. When a saint can't forgive a saint, one of them is not a child of God. If a saint cannot worship together with another saint, then one of them is not a child of God. Brother Branham says every move produces twins. See? Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Jesus and Judas. See? But you see on what side you are. Are you on the lineup of, G- of, of Jesus or Judas. And then Jesus tells us a story here of what happens among believers. If you like to, uh, if you love the word of God, let's read that again. Look at verse 23. Therefore, is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king who would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him who owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had nothing with which to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and lose him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him an hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he will not, but went 
and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So, when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgive thee all that thou, uh, all that debt, because thou besoughtest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was angry and delivered him to the inquisitions till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother his trespasses. Praise the Lamb of the Lord. Well, this is self-explanatory. We all know that the king that is being spoken about here is Christ himself. Amen. And the servants are you and I. When we confess our sins to God, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Amen. He's faithful. I have experienced that. <laughs> when God forgives you, there is a certain joy that floods your soul. You know that God has removed that darkness from you. That guilt is gone. But how do we treat others that trespass against us? It says this king forgave the servant all, all. Just because he was sorrowful and besought him to please forgive because he has no power to pay. He had nothing to pay with. How could we have paid for our sins? How could I have paid for my sins? How could you have paid for your sins? We have nothing to pay with. Nothing. Somebody said in the scriptures, what will I come with before the Lord? Shall I bring my firstborn, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? Then the scripture said, He has showed you, O man, what is good and what the Lord desires of you. That you walk humbly with your God. That you love mercy. See? Love mercy. Love to be merciful. The rapture would take many by surprise. They'll be quoting Brother Branham. <laughs> They'll be quoting Brother Branham on the head. But in the heart, they are like this servant here, right here. These ones are not Muslims or Hindus. Christ was talking to Peter and the rest of the apostles. In other words, you and I. The master forgave him all. Now, he found favor before the master. And he can pray now. And the master heard him and forgave him all. But he couldn't forgive his brother. He held him by the throat. Not even by the hand, by the throat. Now you know what that means. Almost going to kill him. And that's where we kill one another. Brother Branham says you don't have to kill a man by putting a gun on his head or stabbing him on the back. Just destroy his character. And you kill the man. He held him by the throat. And said pay me the ten, ten cents you owe me. Pay me now or you're dead. And such a one will come back to the house of God to pray. And you expect the king to hear this prayer? No. no. See? Because of his action, the king remembered or withdrew the forgiveness that was given to him. And threw him in jail. See? We are talking about prayers tonight. Prayers have conditionalities. It's not just coming to the house of the Lord and praying. What is your relationship with the king? What is your relationship with God? Are you in friendship? We have a song in our song, uh, song that says, Friendship with Jesus, Fellowship Divine. Oh, sweet communion. Jesus is a friend of mine. You know that song? You know? 
what, what, if, he, if he's a friend or, or a father, I love, I love that title, father. Amen. When you say our father, it shows I have relationship with him. Amen. Amen. But you see, am I an obedient child? Am I an obedient son to God? Am I a prodigal son to God? Am I a disobedient son? The Bible says there's a spirit that worketh in the sons of disobedience. They are sons, but there's a spirit that makes them disobey. And yet they come to the house of the Lord to pray. But they are not obedient children. Nothing can be as sweet as an obedient child. Nothing. It's so sweet. An obedient child. So sweet. It makes a proud father. It makes a proud mother. But a disobedient child is a shame. It's a disgrace to the family. So are we with God. When we are obedient to God, we manifest his glory everywhere. But if we are disobedient, Brother Branham says the worst thing that uh, 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 turns people away is uh, uh, Christians who are hypocritical. People think you're a Christian, then they find out you're not. How many times will my brother offend me and I forgive him? How many times will my wife offend me and I forgive her? How many times will my husband offend me and I forgive him? 70 times 7 in one day. One day. Yeah. Make room for offenses. Make room for provocations. Make room for it. Amen. Because it must come. The only thing that will not offend you in your life, in your family, in your home are furnitures. Your table cannot offend you. Your bed cannot offend you. The radio cannot offend you. Because they have no feelings. They have no feelings. But as human, we have feelings. You may not like what I like. I may not like what you like. But that doesn't mean nothing. To show that God is inside you, you should love mercy. So that when you lift up your holy hands to pray, Paul says, I wish that men pray everywhere. Lifting up holy hands. How holy are our hands? How holy are our hands that we lift up? The Bible says, if we lay our hands on the sick, they recover. Because the hand is holy. Is the hand holy? All right. Let me read something here before we go on. In the book of Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. I'm reading verse, uh, verse 12. 6 and verse 12. And it came to pass... In those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. My, who was that? Our Lord himself. Teaching us how serious prayer can be. How serious prayer can be. Do you have a set time to pray? It's not necessary. Because... If you have a set time to pray, sometimes something will happen and you're not able to pray at that time that you set for yourself. And you begin to think you have sinned against God. No, you haven't. The Bible says pray without season. Here we see the Lord himself going to the mountain, separating himself from the public to go and pray. Does he need that? As long as he was in the flesh, he needed it. Though he is God, yet found to be a man, He needed it. He went into the mountain and prayed all night. Now, we all know Brother Branham had a cave where once in a while he withdraws himself and goes to have some quiet time with God. In America here, it's different. Back home, every first Friday, Friday of every month, every Friday of every Every first Friday of every month, the whole church will come together and we pray from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning. In my church, we have young men, about 30 or 35 young men. We call them the 11th hour laborers. Their responsibility is to go out, preach in buses, open air meetings, visit churches, you know, Every Sunday back home, every Sunday we baptize people. Every Sunday. Every Sunday we baptize people. Then we have another group we call the prayer group. 
they come to church one hour before the uh, church starts. And they pray for one hour before the church starts. I'm not saying you do the same thing here. It may not work for you because of your, your uh, uh, peculiar conditions. But I'm just trying to show to you how serious it is with us. With us. The Bible said he withdrew and went to the mountain and continued all night. That is to show to us how important it is to communicate with God. If you're going to make it, if you're going to overcome, many people are backsliding because they do not have the life of prayer. So they have no power, nothing to sustain them. They can tell you what Brother Abraham said to the dot. Yes, perfectly. But step on their toe and see how violent they will react. Because there's nothing inside. Temperance. Self-control. You can't exhibit it if you don't have it. Christ in you. When he was slapped, what did he do? When they spit on him, what did he do? So you see, that life has to be in us today. Not just the letter of the word, but the life of the word. Jesus said, in Genesis, the day you commit this sin, that day you die. God told Adam, but you see, the covenant changed. And a woman caught in the same sin in Genesis was brought to him. Because the covenant has changed. See what he did. He says, look, all of you are the same. You're all sinners. If you don't have your sin, throw the first stone. And those guys there were honest enough to drop their stones and walk away. They were not hypocritical because he would have exposed them right there. It's the same thing today. When we sit on the seat of judgment to judge a brother, to judge a sister, first ask yourself, if Jesus was sitting here on this seat, what would he do? Amen. Don't be quick to pass judgment. Don't be quick to comment when you hear anything bad about any brother, about any sister. Don't say nothing. Because you don't know all the truth. You only know half of it or a part of it. Or maybe what you heard is not even real. But Abraham says a witness should be an eyewitness. Not ear. Eyewitness. The Bible says Christ is the righteous judge. You know why? He doesn't judge by the hearing of the ear. He does not judge by the seeing of the eye. He judges because he sees the heart. We don't see the heart. Unless God reveals it to us, we can see the heart. So you see that as God's children, for us to pray like Elisha, I mean like Elijah, like Elisha, like Brother Branham, like Paul, these great men prayed. I mean they prayed. And we were told that a prayer cloth was taken from Paul and the sick was healed. We were told that the shadows of Peter healed the sick. These are men of prayers. Men that prayed. Brother Branham taught us to pray. Watch that film again. Deep, call it to the deep. Our 20th century prophet. Watch it again. Don't worry about the miracles. We've seen that. Watch Brother Branham pray. He prays with a broken heart. Tears flowing. Watch it again. And you know what? The scripture says, a broken heart and a contrite spirit, God will never ignore. Never. Never. Although God used that man so tremendous, yet he always found time to pray. He never relied on the greatness of yesterday. He never relied on the great miracles of past years. Each time he wants God's presence for now. Let me tell you since, yesterday's prayer is fine, but today 
We need to pray. Amen. Every day. Every hour. It says pray without ceasing. Amen. I'm bringing this. Uh, try to read a few scriptures here and I'll close. Turn with me to the book of Acts. Chapter 6. Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 6. I'm reading verse 4. Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, you see, they go together. They go together. A minister must be a praying man. A praying man is the only man that can be a minister. You may not be a minister of the church, but God can use you outside there to minister the word to people. But they go together. The apostles here had a problem in hand. And uh, they got some faithful men, deacons, to handle the problem. But they said, look, we will give ourselves to prayers and to the ministry of the word. That's very important. Let nothing else be more important. Nothing. Nothing else can be compared to the importance of praying. It is through prayers that we get inspiration to minister. It is through prayers that God gives you something to, 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 to give to the church. Paul says, I give unto you as I have received of the Lord. Amen. See? Some, some, uh, unfortunately now, some ministers, all they do uh, pull out some quotes from the computer. No prayers, no inspiration, nothing. Just pull out some quotes and read and read and read. And anybody can do that. But you see, a real praying man stays on his knees until he hears from heaven. And then what he hears from heaven will tally what, with what the prophet has already told us. Because God knows who is coming to church. God knows who is coming. He said to Peter, you love me? Yes, feed my sheep. You love me? Yes, Lord, feed my lamb. The lamb and the sheep don't eat the same thing. The lamb takes milk. And the sheep eats grass, if I'm correct. So God gives you something. And God gives you the grace to be able to rightly divide the word. So that everybody in the congregation will take something home. One or two slices of bread of life. So it takes prayer and the ministry of the word to balance the faith of God's children in God. Prayers. Find time to pray. Find time. The Bible says redeem the time for the days are evil. Don't say, well, you're too busy. You can be busy in everything. Nobody has, nobody has been too busy uh, not to go to the uh, undertaker. What do you call it here? Mortuary? Is that a mortuary? Amen. I never see anybody too busy. When it's time for the mortuary, you go there. <laughs> no, 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 brother. You don't say, well, that. Dead, hold a minute, I don't have time to die. No. When it comes, everything stops. I asked a brother some time ago, where do they sell time so that you can buy some? I don't have time. Where do they sell it? Plan your program. See? Have time for God. Have time for God. Find time to pray. If you want to overcome, if you want to overcome, if men like Samson filled with the Holy Ghost from the mother's womb was pulled down by a woman. Samson destroyed a thousand men. The name of Samson struck terror in many kingdoms. But a woman, a woman, because Samson was careless. Brother Branham says Samson gave his strength to God. And then gave his heart to a woman. Some people are like that. Amen. They give all their money to women, come to the house of God with nothing. Wow. Some give all their time to 
uh, uh, put bread on the table and have no time for God. Yeah. We must find time. If a man like David, a man after God's own heart, God testified, David was a man after his own heart, a woman, God, David messed up until he killed the wife. God used these men to show to us no matter how much Holy Ghost you have, you are not immune to temptation. You are not, you, you don't have immunity. You can be tempted even when you're not expecting one. But prayer is the secret. Prayer is the key to overcome. The apostle says, you handle this, 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 this. But we will give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. That is very crucial. So as we study the message, as we enjoy the great revelations of this hour, how fortified are we? And how beautiful is our relationship with God? You know, there are some husbands and wives, they disagree and they don't talk to each other for a very long time. Sometimes it's like that with us and God. No time to pray, no time to talk to God. But there are some families, husband and wife, that are so sweet, so sweet. There's nothing sweeter than a, a husband and a wife in, in a beautiful relationship. So it is with some Christians. Their relationship with God is wonderful. That they are the apples of God's eyes. And the devil cannot touch them. Because God will be jealous of the devil touching them. Because they are obedient children, prayerful, always in communication with heaven. That's what God wants from us. All right. Finally. I don't know if anybody here was praying for me to close. God has answered now. <laughs> after, this, after this passage. <laughs> All right. We're reading the beautiful passage, uh, uh, James chapter 5. I'd like for you to read that with me, please. James chapter 5, yes. James chapter 5. Look at verse 13. <coughs> Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. That's the two that express the condition of our hearts. We are either miserable or we are very happy. Now the Bible did not say if you, if you are afflicted, you should worry and worry and worry. Worry is a sickness of his own. And worry does not solve any problem. It doesn't. It just gives you hypertension and high blood pressure. That's all you get by worrying and worrying and worrying. And when you worry, it shows that you have no faith. Doubt brings worries. Is any afflicted? That means if you are sick, if you have a problem, what can, whatever problem it is, if you know that God is with you, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Amen. Where there seems to be no way. God can open the Red Sea for Moses and his men to pass through. You may not need a Red Sea open, but you may need somebody move from office. I'll give you an example. I have a brother in my church. Good brother, good brother. But the devil came upon his boss in his, in his job. And he would bother this brother, bother him and worry him and even threaten to, to, to uh, relieve him of his job. And this brother came to me and told me. First time, second time, third time. And I said, brother, let us pray. And we prayed sincerely, fervently. And I said to him, go back to your job. If you are honest, God will remove that man from there. And he left. And brothers and sisters, it was less than one month that man was removed. The boss was removed. Amen. See? Amen. That our brother now, he's raised and uh, they sent him for a training in Germany. He's been to Germany twice now, specializing in a BMW car working for a company uh, in Nigeria. That's, that's not the only one. There are about three or four like that. God, God can make a way where you think there is no way. Is any afflicted? He says, let him pray. He didn't say worry 
and cry and miserable and stay home. You don't come to church anymore because you're afflicted. That's not what he said. Pray. It's not your business how the solution will come. Just be obedient enough to pray. Come to God. Kneel down here. Don't worry about anybody. Don't worry about anybody. You remember Anna? Anna in the Old Testament. She had a problem and she just came and knelt down. And the priest said, you're drunk? She said, no, I'm not drunk. Okay. If you're not drunk, may God answer you. I don't know what you're praying about. And after she was satisfied, she went home, came back the next year with a baby. And then she said to the priest, this is that which I was asking God that day. Amen. That's how God works. Amen. Don't worry about anybody. Don't worry about anybody. Just come here and pour your heart out to God like water. Amen. Amen. Go back. You have done what he said you should do. Then believe. Believe that the God you pray to, he has ears and he can hear. And he's a God that answers prayers. Then he says, if any of you is happy, let him sing. Praise the Lord. Don't forget God when things are good. When the business begins to boom, when you have a raise in your office, raise your tithe also. Raise your offering also. Some people have put a seal to their offering. They give God $5 in January, December. Gen from January to December is $5. No, no increment. Even if they have a raise in their office. Even if they have a boom, they still give the same. That is not how to sing praise. God raised you. You raise him too. Amen. Amen. Bring your tithes. Bring your offering. Yes. Amen. Sincerely. Yes. And see what God will do for you. Amen. <coughs> see? If you are merry, he says sing psalms. Sing psalms. Praise God. Worship him. Because he has blessed you. And then he says in verse uh, 14.